I'm not going to lie. I'm completely going to wing this. This really, you know, was a decision. I was talking to Robert, who's SVP of Catalyst. I'm sure you've met him. I was preparing a TEDx talk for next week, and it really made me grateful that Catalyst Creative was started and that we've been able to create a very different type of talk, a talk that isn't about necessarily an idea, but about who you are as a person, because Preparing for this TEDx talk is truly exhausting. And I know at Catalyst Week, you can really get up here and share who you are. And that's really what I think you all want to hear. So uh, the reason why it actually makes sense for me to be here during this month, and I've never given a Catalyst Week talk before. I'd like to preface with that. Uh, so I figured, why not give the last Catalyst Week talk? Um, but I have a master's in education, so curriculum and instruction, actually. And everyone throws around the word curriculum now, which I think is so funny, but you know, seven years, or seven years ago, eight years ago, when I graduated with a master's in curriculum, no one really thought it was cool besides the education world. So when I graduated, you know, again, my story is a little bit unique. I, I tell a few stories here and there, um, but I'll start with one story that I like to tell often which is that when I was three years old, every single day in my diaper, I would line up my stuffed animals on the stairs, uh, I would galvanize them essentially, I would make sure they were very comfortable, and then I would take a seat at my green hippo piano and sing happy birthday to friends every single day for an entire year. Uh, and so I was essentially a community builder at three years old and uh, of diverse, very diverse groups of, of thinking. It was all a very diverse group of stuffed animals. Um, but it was really in my blood to, to build community. And as I got older, my, my mom tells the story when I was eight years old. And I really look back to, I would, would want everyone to kind of think about who they were when they were eight back before, you know, and we talked about this sometimes in the beginning of Catalyst Week, but before they had bills or their parents told them what they had to do, um, when they really could dream. Uh, and when I was eight, I was, I was galvanizing my entire first grade class to share snacks with each other, facilitating snack exchange in the cafeteria. Uh, and so again, there was always this part of me that was this community organizer, but I didn't really know what to do with that. And so I ended up going, you know, I got tested for ADHD three times in elementary school. I moved so much in my seat. I was so frustrated. Um, I just, I felt very disconnected from sitting in a seat, being told to talk when you actually are called on. I was like, I want to talk the entire time. I don't want to, I don't want to just talk when you call on me. Why do you have control over me? Um, and, and it was really difficult, but I didn't have ADHD. I was just super disengaged. And I think a lot of us here probably felt that way growing up in the typical education system. But ironically, I really had you know, this, this vision to make the world better through education. And I thought that I loved kids. I thought, why not become a teacher and change the way education is? Change the way that these kids experience education in the classroom uh, and, and really you know, not, al not allow them to have to be sitting in a chair all day long and feeling frustrated. And so I went to school, got my master's in curriculum and, instru and instruction, but I wrote my thesis on this whole new concept. I really wanted to explore what would it look like to take students outside of the classroom, use the community as the classroom, whatever that community is, we call it nature-based learning. So whether it was an urban environment, a rural enver environment, suburban environment, um, use the community and then measure the impact on engagement and achievement. And so we created actually a metrics of engagement um, through these two professors, Bangert, uh, Drowns, and Pikes. And it was these seven levels that we applied to first graders. And we did analysis, interview sampling. We really measured what does it look like when that little girl in the, in the chair is moving all over the place and you think she has ADHD. That's actually frustrated engagement. It's a level of engagement. When the kid in the chair is maybe spitting, you know, doing spitballs across the room, that's disengagement, but it's a level of engagement. And what we found is when we take kids outside, use their, their outdoor environment, and apply it to a lesson, they actually are more engaged and then in turn more highly achieving. So while I was in this program, I was throwing events during in New York City in nightlife and throwing parties on the side because as I told you, I was a party planner since I was three years old. Um, and I, I really had this, this two 
two-prong life going on. I was, I was wanting to become a teacher, but I felt very stifled in the classroom. I was in, the f I was in a first grade classroom during my student year. I was in an enrichment fifth through eighth program. I was in some of the worst sc schools in the entire country, in Hartford and Rahway. I was in some of the best schools in Glastonbury. Uh, and I really, this is all in Connecticut, because everyone's kind of like, what are these places? Um, and what ended up happening was I saw these teachers that I was working with really get stifled by a lot of the parents, by the Board of Education, um, just by people that really didn't understand that they wanted to be creative. And they had so many rules and regulations. And I saw myself and I said, I'm such a creative thinker. And I was so frustrated in that chair. So this is just the bigger chair. It's just called the bureaucracy of the education system. That's the chair that I would be sitting in for a long time. And I, I saw myself and said, how can I change education if I'm in the system. I have to figure out how to get out of the system and, and really disrupt it in a different way. And so I, I really started to kind of think about this and I graduated, it was 2009, we talked about this yesterday, a huge recession. Um, and I started looking for jobs, but I didn't look for teaching jobs. I really just started looking for jobs that came my way. And the job that came my way was a nightlife and hospitality company in New York City. Reason being, for the past few years, I was throwing nightlife events in New York City to make extra money on the side, and because I just really like to throw parties. And so I graduated at this within this company, and I got hired, I was the only woman, I'm touching on a lot of different subjects, from in terms of diversity, that was a very interesting one. It's like very much that little black bouncing ball, but with like long brown hair. Um, I was the only woman in nightlife and hospitality, and what happened was we ended up really doing well. Scaling very quickly. Went from three to nine restaurants in three and a half years. We were working with huge brands, LVMH and Unilever and uh, Harley Davidson. I was throwing these, I was you know, helping open all these restaurants. I was overseeing all the events and marketing. I was hiring people left and right. I ended up kind of actually becoming a high level like executive in this company. And I was going all around New York City with Robert actually <laughs> in Catalyst, going to all these random parties. And I was like, what happened? I used to be a teacher. I used to be making a difference in the world. I used to be teaching first graders how to read and how to tell time. And I used to care so much about each and every single one of those kids in my classroom. And now I'm literally getting thousands and thousands of dollars to get people drunk all of the time. Very similar to first graders, by the way. When, when Wall Street guys get drunk, they're very similar to first graders. But it didn't feel the same. And so in that moment, I really started asking myself kind of, what happened here? And I started to look in my environment and the people that I was around and, and really at myself, and I said, how do I make the world better? How do I go back to that teacher inside me? Because once you're a teacher, I think that everyone in the world should be a teacher and a waitress at one point of their lives. Because I think when you're a teacher, you, you really can't ever not think about making the world better. Because when you see that you can have an impact on a child's life, life you know that you really do have the power to, to change the world. Um, and so I started to say, what can I do to make the world better? And I didn't really know, but what I decided was, let me try to use these restaurants and donate them to different charities every week and help them with their fundraising efforts. Every single week, a different charity, donate the restaurant, throw some nice events for them, they get some money, the restaurant gets some people in there, and I'll feel good about myself, I'll give back. And so I started every single week with a different charity, throwing these events while I was at my full-time job. I ended up waking up at three in the morning, I don't know if anyone has ever done this, building a PowerPoint presentation for a nonprofit music festival. I'd never even been to a music festival before. And met some folks that were doing the same thing and actually got involved in building this nonprofit music festival. And I was just doing all these random things, help with the Summit Series, help with build a TEDx, all while having my full-time job because I lived in New York City and there's no way to just do fun things in New York without making money. Let me tell you the honest truth. That's because you live, literally you pay $3,000 a month for that boat size, the size of your boat, that's New York City living. And so I really, I had to kind of explore what was that next step? What made me happy, but how can I make the world better and also get paid for it? And in that time, I met Tony Shea at a conference. Uh, and it was a conference I was working at. I was not invited to the conference. I was working the conference and he was attending. 
and he had a few group, you know, few people around him, and he invited everyone to come to Vegas. And I was in this time of my life where I was saying yes to a lot of things. I said yes to a, a short India trip to Panama, to Detroit, um, and I said yes to come to Vegas. Very different places, by the way. India, Detroit, Panama. I just wanted to throw that out there. But I ended up in downtown uh, three and a half years ago, and. When I got here, I mean, I had no idea what was going on. I was very confused. Tony, the story that I tell, which is very true and he loves, is that he didn't remember inviting me out here. So when I went to say hello to him, he backed away. Some people know this story. It's very awkward. Um, but I looked around and I said, this isn't the strip. Like, where am I? And the Ogden was here. Latai was here. The Beat was here. There was a few key places, DCR. Um, and, but I was really confused. I didn't really know what was going on. And he didn't know who I was. So I was kind of like, uh, okay, I guess I'll, I'll just explore this place. And in those few days, what happened was I ended up really seeing this. There was the Lucky Lady Lucy was, you know, instead of now, it's like the, the downtown grand. I don't even know what it is now. But all these old, unbelievably kind of like uh, vintage-looking buildings that I felt had so much potential. And this city that was not really there yet, but I felt like it was kind of that student that was frustrated and engaged. Like, it was a frustrated and engaged city. Like, how do we create this into that higher levels of engagement? How do we tell this story in a way that gets more people down here? Because I knew there was something there. It just wasn't maybe glistening in the same way yet. And so Tony said, I don't remember who you are. Come have lunch with me. Uh, and so I did. And he said, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I don't really know, but what I do know is that I know education. I know how to design a curriculum and instruction. I know events and hospitality. So I know that I can essentially combine those two efforts. I know marketing and strategy to help create experiences that inspire people. Because I was lucky enough to meet you at an event, but what about all these other people that are not going to be invited to TED? because it's $10,000 and it's the 1% for the 1%, or Summit Series, or any of these conferences. I said, how do we reach more and more people through inspirational experiences? And how do we leverage, essentially, in my mind, brands, thought leaders, celebrities, use them as the teachers to the world, and make it accessible, an accessible price point or free? And he said, do it here in Vegas. And I looked around, I'm like, at the coffee shop? Like, where do you want me to do this? And I said, I live in New York City. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to downtown Vegas. Like, I like it here. It's so amazing, but I'm not moving. And so six months later, I went back to my cushy job in New York City, and something felt very off. And again, I was kind of already on this journey, but I ended up really looking at myself and saying, what do I want? I'm making money. I'm rising the ranks. I was about to be VP of this company, but I wasn't happy. I said, I want to make the world a better place. I want to apply myself to do good in the world with the knowledge that I have of branding and strategy and events and marketing and education. And so Catalyst Week started. It was seven days, Sunday to Sunday, 40 people, some of my friends that are completely insane. They brought an Airstream and were like driving all around the strip. It was completely crazy. But it was incredible. And what happened was they started sharing on social media, They just totally organically. And from there, it started to explode. More and more people started reaching out to me and saying, how do I go to Catalyst Week? What is this Catalyst Week? How do I go to downtown Vegas? And I was like, oh, I don't, I'm one person. Like, I don't know. Like, this is insane. And so the company started to form. And other clients started saying, how do we work with you? Like, how do we create these they didn't know what we were doing, but they were like, it's working somehow, so how do we do what you're doing in Vegas, but, but with our clients? And so we ended up being able to bring on my best friend, Robert, who was, which was a dream of ours to be able to work together. And Robert in Chicago, we bootstrapped a client there. And we brought on a Danielle, who's in New York, and Mike, who's in Philadelphia, and Evelyn now, who's in Las Vegas, and, and Dave, who's in Las Vegas. And we really, the company organically grew. And it was from really this effort of designing a curriculum for brands to engage consumers in a different way and inspire consumers. And so Downtown Project, people say, how do you make money? I don't get it. Downtown Project became our first client. They invested in us. We were one of the first investments. It was a very random bet. And they also became our client. And Catalyst Week was the service that we were offering. It bringing amazing people to a city, downtown Vegas, an influencer program, if you will, for a city that was being built. And from there, Coca-Cola hired us around a sustainability initiative. W Hotels hired EcoCycle, Katie Carey in the back, 
kudos to her because she pushed for us in a huge way. And it's really been our network pushing for us to work with big brands to engage millennials and consumers in an inspirational and educational way. And we've changed who we are and we've changed what we've done and we've changed our titles and we've changed, I mean, we've changed a lot. But at the end of the day, my core mission and our core mission is really just creating more active participants and making the world better. Inspiring more and more people to make the world better. And so if that's a content platform, if that's Catalyst Week, if that's a large scale event in New York City, if that's an online campaign, if it goes back to the roots of educating people around making the world a better place, we are going to do that. And so I wanted to tell that story. I feel so grateful every day to work with clients that care about the world, people that care about the world, my best friends that, that when people say, what's the future of Catalyst? It's working with these people and doing this. I get emotional because it's, it's my dream. Um, and so I feel so grateful to have been able to start this and to show up to Catalyst Week and not really know many people anymore. And it's been such an honor to um, have been able to do this for the past two and a half years. And I thank you. That's it. Thanks so much. <laughs>